That's all I'm saying. There you go. <gasps> That's exactly right. <laughs> David. He meant saying things like, stop it. Stop chewing on that. Stop peeing on the floor. You know. She still pees on the floor. Joe, look at this. <laughs> you are an enabler. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related, real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Welcome to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we continue with our month of men. Dun, 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 dun. Oh. Not that kind. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I just have this like Chip and Dale's picture in my head when you say that. <laughs> okay, I'm really scared now, David. <laughs> you just you're thinking of the calendar, Chip and Dale's calendar, yeah, or something. Yeah, when you say the month of men, I, for some reason I think of the calendars. I do. Hey, we could do a calendar like a year of stepdads. Mm-hmm. Oh, you could do a year of stepmoms, and everybody like pulling their hair out and going crazy. Yeah. That'd be that'd be interesting. All right, add that to the list. <laughs> we, we got enough going on. I know. Well, our guest today is Joel Hall Baker. Yeah, good job. You didn't have to say that. Well, he made a point of saying a lot of people call him Hall Baker, and it's not. It's, I want to call him Hall Baker. You probably want to call him a lot of names. I do. Yeah, that's what I figured. We'll just go ahead and preface this with Joel had us on his podcast. Mm-hmm. There was a glitch. So he had to deal with us again. There was no glitch. He just wanted to talk to us again. Yeah. <laughs> so we talked to him again. Well, you know, after spending an hour with somebody, the second time you're like, oh, I know them. So I guess he felt more comfortable with pushing my buttons. Does it take a level of comfortability to do that, though? It doesn't help you that he had a fellow button pusher on his side. Right. You. <laughs> So there's a little bit of button pushing going on here, Mm -hmm. which I think that I make the comment of, I still don't like button pushers, Mm -hmm. but I'm married to one. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we're not going to get off on the button pushing topic because I'll start getting stressed and then I'll have to nacho David. (laughs) I haven't even done anything yet. You're a button pusher. You don't have to do anything. Notice I said yet. I know because oftentimes it's the anticipation of the button pushing that is actually worse than the button pushing. The b- button pushing? The button. The button pushing. Button. Which, if you think about it, is exactly what a lot of people do in their blended relationship. They anticipate the problems long before and maybe sometimes even when the problems never arise. That's the fortune telling ant. Exactly. How many times have I seen, I know you have, people who say, it's Wednesday. I'm already freaking out that the kids are coming Sunday. I'm like, oh, my gosh. (laughs) I used to do that. Oh, I know. We all have done it. But it is so unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And you're already setting yourself up to anticipate something that may not even happen. And honestly, when you're looking for it to happen, it tends to happen because you're looking for it. You're going to make sure it happens. Uh, Yeah, it's like. I'm going to prove myself right. I'll be wrong if it doesn't happen. So let's make this happen. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it happens in a lot of areas. People, once they realize that they're doing that to themselves, it's very freeing to to say, look, I'm not going to worry about it until it happens. Well, the thing is, we underestimate the power of our mind. Mm -hmm. And we talk about that a lot in the Not Your Kids Boot Camp Challenge and the Change Your Stinking Thinking Challenge. But I still don't think people get a grasp on it. Mm -mm. So for instance, say that I on my way home and it's a Wednesday and the stepkids are there and they were supposed to do chores during the day while they were here for summer or whatever. If I rile myself up on the way home thinking, I know they didn't do those dishes. I know they didn't. They don't ever do anything and their daddy's not going to punish them for it or blah, 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 blah. So I started spiraling, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you see how this turned into the dishes didn't get done, I'm assuming, to David's a crappy dad. I mean, all that happened in like a split second, right? You walk in, and sure enough, the dishes aren't done. That just adds gasoline to your fire. Mm -hmm. Okay? Which is why people look at you and go, why is she so crazy? Right. (laughs) But I have learned, okay, and this is a trick. So take note, if you 
don't allow yourself to have those thoughts on the way home, okay? Just tune them out, crank the radio up, sing a song, call a friend, something. Don't think about the dishes. You walk in, the dishes aren't done. Are you mad? Yes. Okay, be mad. Walk away, put your stuff up, change your clothes, whatnot, whatever you do in your routine. Tell yourself, I know those dishes aren't done, and when I walk back in the kitchen, I'm not going to let it make me mad, okay? You walk back in the kitchen, you see the dishes, you feel that twinge. You feel that little man going, get mad, get mad, get mad. No, tell the little man to leave you alone, okay? Walk away, do something else. You don't have to let the fact that the dishes did not get done by your stepkid ruin your entire night with your family. Mm -hmm. Question I would have, though, is if you expected the dishes to not be done and you got what you expected— Why are you mad? Because you always have hope. (laughs) But now I don't. I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. I understand that, but think about how crazy this is. If if you get in life what you expect, then why does it upset you that you got what you expected? Change your expectations. Yes. Stop expecting other people to be you, because then they can't be themselves. (laughs) I feel like we're going on a t-shirt rant here. But the point of, and I don't know if I'm conveying this properly, but if you go in with the mindset of, yeah, the dishes aren't done, but I'm not going to let it piss me off. Mm-hmm. You have the ability to do that. Yeah. You can't control the fact that the dishes aren't done. Right. Because they're not done. And you can't control the fact that David's not going to punish his kids for not having the dishes done by the time you got home. Right. I don't. And think I want to punish my kids for all the listeners, though. <laughs> Come on, help me out. Now. Okay, I'm following you. Go ahead. Okay. What you can control is how you let these things affect you. Mm-hmm. I can go in, slam stuff around, do the dishes, chip a couple of plates in the process to prove my point, to let everybody know how unhappy I am. Then I'm not spending time with my kid because I'm a grumpy butt. I'm not spending time with Dave because I'm mad at him about the dishes. Yeah, but even more importantly, what you've done is you've taken the focus off of the problem, the dishes not being done, and you've put it on you and your attitude. Because I did the dishes in anger, right? Mm -hmm. Many people can just go, you know what? They're not done. Oh, well, it's going to take me 10 minutes to do them. I'm just going to do them so I can get them cleaned up. Yeah. Or if uh, your significant other's home, that's when you go, hey, honey, can you help me do the dishes right quick? We got to talk about Joel, David. Yeah, Joel. Well, I'm setting up Joel's interview. Okay. So Joel is a stepkid himself. Mm-hmm. He is a teacher. Man. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have any stepkids, but he has two bio kids. Yep. That have an awesome stepmom because of Joel's lovely wife. Mm-hmm. I just realized something, David. What's that? Joel's lovely wife and I... Have something in common. That you're both married to button pushers. Exactly. I figured that was coming. I can bond with her. You don't even know her. I I can feel it. (laughs) I can bond with her. All right. Well, get her on the podcast because I would love to push her buttons. No. I want to see just how much Joel has trained and desensitized her (laughs) to the button pushing. (laughs) Well, we talked about this with Joel. I don't remember if it was on the first episode that we tried to do or whatever, but Anyway, um, we talk about how the radio stations used to do like War of the Roses, Mm -hmm. where they would send roses to somebody and the person would have to kind of guess who they were from. Mm -hmm. And it caught a lot of people being um, not faithful in their relationships. And so remember you and Joel said something about calling people and seeing how long it would take them to hang up on you from you pushing their buttons. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't part of this interview, but we did talk about that. (laughs) We had a good time with Joel. Yeah. All right. To tell you just a little bit about Joel before we get started, Joel is the founder of 10 CBF Podcast, and it stands for 10 Commandments for Blended Family. Joel started 10 CBF three or four years ago to help and encourage blended families. We'll talk more about that in the interview so you can get all the deets. And we will let you know when we are on his podcast. I know. Or when he airs it. Yep. Come on, Joel. (laughs) My gosh. Why are you pushing his buttons? I'm not. See? Mm. I'm not a button pusher. Whatever. All right. That's my way of saying, Joel, when are you going to air uh, our podcast? I, I love how you got 
really nice when you started the second time. Look, it's called being a chameleon. Is that what it is? You adjust to your surroundings. Mm. You got me riled up. Mm -hmm. All right, let's let's get to listening. Stop talking to me, David. Stop talking to me. Most predators do adjust to their surroundings. Oh, my goodness. I can just see you like the little beady eyes in the water. (laughs) And you just lift up. Okay. (laughs) All right. Here we go. You ready? I reckon. All right. So we're going to hear from Joel. (laughs) There is a way to save your sanity and your relationship, and it's called the Nacho Kids Academy. In the Nacho Kids Academy, you will learn the skills and knowledge to properly nacho, techniques to handle step family challenges, ways to improve your communication, and much, much more. Visit NachoKidsAcademy.com and sign up today to join other step parents who are seeing the life changing benefits of nachoing. Again, that's NachoKidsAcademy.com. I want to welcome everybody to our month of men continuation. We have Joel Hallbaker with us, and uh, Joel interviewed us on his podcast recently. Has it aired yet? It has not aired yet, no. I was wondering because I hadn't got any hate mail. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Now give it time. So, uh, so yeah, so Joel has his own podcast. We'll talk about that during the interview. But we also want to talk about his blend and how all that's going for him. Because we love getting the male perspective. Because it is the right perspective. Mm. <laughs> I'm here, y'all. Don't worry. <laughs> I would like to say that when we met Joel, it only took a brief amount of time for David and him to bond over button pushing. That's right. Mm-hmm. They are proud button pushers. Yep. Mm-hmm. So all yep. you button pushers, I still think you are horrible people. Yeah. Joel and I <laughs> may create a podcast. That's right. It's going to be great. It's going to be tips on how to push your wife's buttons. Yeah. How to push a stepmom's buttons. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't want to do that. No. No, but that'd still be a good one to have. I, yeah. I don't even think that'd be real hard. Like they've already got <laughs> enough going on. Yeah. No, we do have the 10 things not to say to a stepmom. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. If we do that, Joel, though, we'll probably have to do self-defense classes in between. Uh, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yeah, or at least how to yeah. run fast. Something. That's exactly right. <laughs> how to duck. You know, Duck, tuck, and roll. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, I, I didn't know you guys had that. Was it 10 things not to say to a stepmom? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's excellent. I, I had never thought about that. I could write a book about things not to say to a pregnant lady. We need to like, talk because somebody in my academy is asking for that. Yeah. Oh, man, I'm telling you what. I learned the hard way things not to say to a pregnant lady in my first marriage. So, yeah. yeah. Well, we've decided we had a lady recently, and we were talking about things that she doesn't want her husband to say to her since it's not Mm. his first baby, but it's hers. I said, yeah, one thing that you probably need to tell him not to say is, well, my first wife just pushed it out like it was nothing. (laughs) Yeah, don't make any comparisons. Like, that's (laughs) never going to go well. No. No, and the thing about it is sometimes the wife will ask you to compare. They'll like to try to mm-hmm. trap you with that. that. I mean, that's on par with saying, does this make me look fat? Yeah, you, just, you can't win there. All right, Joel, tell us about your blend. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, <laughs> for, for the listener, that was not hints at reasons why I'm divorced. Okay, I just, It wouldn't surprise me, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Telling you what. Um, so my blended family experience started when I was a kid, my parents split up when I was in middle school, about a year later, my mom started dating a man that even though he and she never married, I still refer to him as my stepdad. So I saw it, uh, from about age 12 or 13 forward. And I had a great example of a blended family. Like my dad and my mom got along better divorced than they had married. And my dad and my stepdad got along really, really well. Uh, you know, I live down in Alabama and my stepdad is a very large African-American male. My mom is about a five foot two white lady. Okay. <laughs> that had to be interesting in Alabama. That's exactly right. In the late nineties in Alabama, that was still pretty taboo. Mm-hmm. And so what was really incredible was that in my family, it wasn't a big deal. Like we, you know, our parents taught us growing up, like people are people are people. And so I didn't think anything about it when mom started dating Brian and my dad didn't either. And as a teenage boy, that didn't make any sense to me because I'm, you can't tell because I'm seated. I'm only five foot three and the Napoleon complex is alive and well in every inch of my five foot three body. (laughs) And so I didn't understand how not to be jealous and envious and those kind of things. And I asked my dad one day, dad, doesn't it bother you to see mom with somebody else? And he said, son, once your mom and I split up, it became no longer my business who she spends her time with. As long as who she spends her time with isn't bad to you and your siblings, it has nothing to do with me. It's not my business. And that didn't make any sense to my brain then. But if you fast forward to when I was an adult, 
it made sense after I got divorced. So I got married for the first time when I was 19. I was halfway through college. She and I were married for eight and a half years. We have two daughters together who today, God bless us, are 16 and 14. Oh, Lordy. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and look, they're wonderful teenage girls, but teenage girls, they absolutely are mm-hmm. with, with everything that can go along with that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm blessed because they're way better kids than I deserve. But, you know, the only thing worse than teenage girls is a teenage boy. Uh, that, no, that's from 50, that, I'm look, I'm telling you from 15 <laughs> years of teaching experience, whew, they're just teenagers. Dude, I had four boys. Yeah. Can't, five. If you want to count Jackson, my stepson, mm-hmm. I would take three times that many boys. Yeah. Then one girl. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Maybe it's just cause maybe it's what you know, you know? Yeah, I'm sure. Well, Lori, you know, she swears up and down that had I had a daughter mm-hmm. that, I would have been so overprotective that I would probably either be in jail for killing somebody else or she would run away because I would smother her or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's very, it's <laughs> very pot. That's that. That was absolutely me as well. Like I was, especially after the divorce. So we, we divorced about 10 years ago and I definitely have been the overprotective father. Uh, and sometimes that's been helpful and other times it's been harmful and we're still working through some of those things. Cause I was also just, I was pretty harsh. Uh, when I was younger, my dad and my mom were both military. And so they raised me with pretty strict rules and you don't disrespect parents ever. And I tried to raise my daughters in the same way that my dad and my mom had raised me. And that didn't go over terribly well. My daughters were very sensitive, had very soft hearts. And my harshness with them caused some lasting damage that we are still dealing with. Thankfully, again, we have a pretty good relationship in general. Uh, I love my kids. They love me. We get along real well when we're around each other. They do both live with their mom full time. And the reasons behind that are myriad and complex. That's what happened about 10 years ago. My ex-wife remarried about six months before I did. That was about seven years ago, six and a half years ago, something like that. Uh, I've been remarried now for, yeah, six and a half years. It'll be It'll be seven. It'll be seven in May. Mm, um, you better know that. She, that's exactly right. Well, I was trying to remember, was it, was it six or seven? Crap. I think it's seven. I always Mel, go with the higher number. This, I promise. I knew. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Well, it hasn't been 10 years. It feels like it's, it's been so good, um, which is true, by the way. Linda families are like dog years, so it's been like 100 years. Oh, yeah. oh dude, that's a great, com- they should, blend, how many blended family years have you been married? Exactly. That should become a thing. We need to make that a thing. Yeah. We can do it. Well, you talk about comparison. Mm -hmm. You know, Lori's always like, I can't wait until I've lasted longer than the first. (laughs) (laughs) She's like, we're going to throw a party when I've lasted longer than the first wire. (laughs) You know, I felt the same way, not in a gloating kind of a way, but just in the sense of, I really want to make this marriage work. And obviously that's a milestone. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I would imagine that's relatively common for people who are in second marriages, not to always be comparing to their first marriage, but to be evaluating in light of Mm -hmm. the first marriage. So I'm a, I'm a history teacher. So I talk a lot about interpretation and the worldview or perspective that people bring to their experiences, because I believe that how you interpret things is based on what you believe and what you have experienced, right? Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, so everybody has their own unique perspective, their own way of understanding the world or whatever. And it would only make sense that you are going to interpret what you are experiencing now in light of what you have experienced in the past for good or bad. And I think that's where a lot of blended family disagreements come from um, is because I'm interpreting something through my experience. My wife, it's her first marriage. She doesn't have any biological kids. She's going to interpret things differently than I am. Mm -hmm. First marriage, no biological kids, but the absolute world's best stepmom. She's going to interpret things differently than me, a bio dad with two kids on his second marriage. Right. We're going to see things very, very differently most of the time. And what we had to realize, we came up with a phrase in our marriage, not better or worse, just different. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yeah. Well, there we got that from a book, Love and Respect by Dr. Emerson Egrix, where he talks about blue lenses or pink lenses, the husband's view versus the wife's view, because, you know, different chromosomes are different things. So men are just different than women. Women are weird because they have two X chromosomes. Men are weird because we have an X and Y chromosome. And there are some things we're just always going to see differently. We just are. God, God made us different. We're going to see things differently. Okay. But that doesn't mean one view is right and the other's wrong mm-hmm. necessarily. Sometimes it does. Yeah. But sometimes it's just different. You see the same data, but you come to very different conclusions about that data because of your starting point. Mm-hmm. Um, I think C.S. Lewis is the one who said what you see depends a great deal on where you are standing 
and also what kind of person you are. Right. And and I think that's a big part of it. That applies too with the stepkids mm-hmm. because there were times that David's kids would say something that happened and I would say something that happened and we were both there yeah. and experienced it, but we experienced different things. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like my story, their story, yep. the truth. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Which makes you question reality, honestly. <laughs> well, yeah. Everybody it, has their own different one. Yeah. It should help people realize what we need to be talking about is not your truth versus my truth. So like in a little 30-second soapbox, that's stupid. You can't have 8 billion <laughs> different truths in the world, okay? Every single person can't. No, 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 that's dumb. Stop that. I just think that's dumb language. You can have your perspective and your experience. And that is true with a lowercase t. But you can't say, well, that's your truth and that's my truth, because if they are diametrically opposed, by definition, (laughs) what does one of them have to be? A lie. It has to be false. It has to be a lie. That's only logical. You can't have every single... That's dumb. Okay, that's the end of Soapbox. So the idea there is... You you might say it's chocolate, but I can call it vanilla. (laughs) But it actually is one of them. Well, my truth... No, that's stupid. (laughs) So anyway... (laughs) But, but everybody yeah. does have their own perspective, and that's important. It's mm-hmm. valid. And that's actually – we just talked about that in my history class recently where I was talking about how if, if, um, if you take two siblings – so if you took two of your sons or your stepsons and you took them to the same event, take them to a fair, take them to a ball game, whatever, you're going to come home, and they're going to give you different versions of that same event mm-hmm. because they're different people. They saw it in different ways. Which one is true? Both of them are true, but they are different representations of the same truth. It's not different truths. It's different versions of the truth. One may be more accurate than the other. Right. Right. One may be more or less true. And, and that's how things are in family. I mean, you guys know with all your kids, like you may get three versions of the same story. None of them are the pure truth. It's not happening. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that's a good way to look at it. I have a question about you being a stepkid, though. Okay. What was your visitation like with your parents? Were you with your mom predominantly or? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we lived with mom full time. Dad moved about two miles down the road. We officially went over to dad's every other weekend. But until I was of driving age, uh, dad came and picked us up for school every morning because the hours mom and dad worked, it actually worked really well. So we still saw dad almost every single day for at least 10 minutes. And I thought that was wonderful because we lived with mom. Dad came and picked us up at mom's house and then we would get home from school. It depended on the day, whether we had sports practice or choir or whatever else it may have been. Because at the same time my parents divorced, my older brother moved out and went to a boarding school. So I became the oldest kid in the house, but I was still only 12 or 13. So for a couple of years. Was that by his choice? Yes. He and my dad did not get along very well at all. And so even when dad moved out, that was not enough distance. And so my brother literally went like five hours away to a boarding school Wow! and never, ever moved back home. He came back home for like vacations, but he never lived at home again. Wow. Um, He and my dad finally reconciled not long before my dad passed away. Dad got diagnosed with terminal cancer back in 2008. I'm so sorry. Thank you. It's, you know, it is what it is. But when that happened, he and my brother were able to reconcile and they became pretty close by the end. And I've always been very grateful for that. But yeah, we were talking about different perspectives. My older brother was parented very differently by our father than I was. And so my dad and my brother butted heads almost my my brother's whole life. My dad and I, peas in a pod. We hardly ever disagreed about anything. And that caused more problems between my brother and my dad because my older brother felt like I was the favorite kid. And so I could get away with more and I got special privileges. And whether that's true or not, I don't know. I didn't see it that way. I just, <laughs> mm-hmm. I just knew my dad and I got along real well. Now, this is your full biological brother. Yes. Yeah. We don't have any step siblings or anything. Okay. Right. So this goes to show even in a nuclear family, yeah. kids are not treated the same. Yep. And they don't have right. to be because every child is different. Like you said, you and your dad are like yeah. peas in a pod. Well, that's his truth. <laughs> <laughs> and your uh, and brother and your dad were like oil and vinegar. Yes, a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, they really were because yeah. dad and I were both very big into sports. We, we both like the athletic kind of lifestyle. And my brother's a great athlete, but it was different sports than what dad had known. And my brother's also very artistic and that was not really dad's style. And so it was hard for dad to understand my brother. It was hard for them to find ways for them to get along. I remember my brother wrote a really great article not long after dad passed away. Um, it's on medium. I wish I could remember the name of it, but it was great. It was heartbreaking. But when my brother was in his uh, late twenties, he went on a, it was like a 50 mile bike ride or something like that. And he, he wrote in this article, he said something about how it was the first time in my life. I ever actually believed that my dad was proud of me. Uh Oh, wow. And it was really heartbreaking 
but it was it was because they just didn't know how to communicate well, and they were very different people. Yeah, that is sad, but I'm glad that they reconciled before his death. Yeah, me too. Yeah, let me ask you this, and I don't necessarily want to chase this rabbit too mm-hmm. far because it's going off off the path. But did your brother feel like like once once your dad passed, did he feel resentment? for taking so long for this reconciliation to happen? That's a great question. I don't know. We don't, John, I don't really talk about that stuff a whole lot. All right, John Hall Baker, we need you as a guest on our <laughs> podcast. <laughs> he, you know, he actually, it's funny because we talk about different kinds of blended families and obviously there's step mm-hmm. families and there's adoptive families and there's foster families. And we have all of those in my extended family. My older brother and his wife have two daughters, almost the exact same age as my daughters, they also have a foster son who is four or five years old. And then my wife's older brother has two biological kids and another on the way. And they have two children who are adopted from overseas. Wow. So we have an adoptive family. Yeah, we have an adoptive family. We've got a foster family. We've got step families. We got all different kinds of blends all in our very close family unit. Well, we got a dysfunctional family. Nice. I feel like that's all of them <laughs> in different different ways. <laughs> That's awesome, but, and I don't mean to say but. (laughs) That's great, but nobody cares. That's what she was going to go with. (laughs) (laughs) What I get for button pushing. Yeah. But do you hear people talk about, like, they'll compare a step family to an adopted family? Mm Mm-hmm. That, that you can't compare it. Right. There are certain similarities in terms of, um, I would argue there's certain areas that overlap. Just in terms of if this is not a biological kid, there are going to be issues that come along with that. Exactly. But you're exactly right that the dynamics are not going to be the same between an adoptive family, a foster family, a step family. Right. They're, they're not. You're correct. They're, they're Again, if it's a Venn diagram, they overlap, but only to a limited degree. Mm-hmm. Did your stepdad parent you? Yes. He didn't. Again, my, they never married, so we didn't ever live with Brian, but we were around him a whole lot. And Oh, okay. So they didn't even live together. No. Correct. They did not. Okay. Um, but he lived again. He lived here in town. We saw him all the time. He came to our sports games. He and, and there were there were definitely times when he parented us. There were times when we were being less obedient or respectful to mom than we should have been. And Brian stepped in and helped out with those kinds of things. And I, I don't know how my sister, I got a younger sister as well. I don't know how she felt about that. I knew that I took it pretty seriously because I had a lot of respect for Brian because he was basically just like my dad. My dad was 10 years older than mom. Mom was 10 years older than Brian. Dad and Brian were, they were completely different in how they looked. My dad was like 5'10", 160 pounds, pale skin, red hair. (laughs) Brian is, Brian's probably 6'1", like 260 African-American guy. (laughs) But look, but they were both airborne army. Mm -hmm. They They were both very strict dudes. They knew how to laugh and have fun, but sweet Lord, I never saw anybody disrespect them. You know how you meet certain people and you think that's not somebody you mess with. Yeah, that's what people think when they meet me. Yeah, <laughs> I was just thinking that. And they would be right. <laughs> it's right. You learned. You, and so, you pushed a button once and you saw what happened, Joe. That's exactly right. I did. I saw what happened. David still got the mark on his face. No way. <laughs> I know. You made her mad. She hit me. <laughs> I did. Yeah, well, she can't reach me. So what do you do? You lash out at those you can reach, right? Yeah. Isn't, that the, well, isn't that what we do as people? Well, she says hurt people hurt people, so. That's, that's right. exactly right. You know, she hurts me all the time. I have to create that balance. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. That's right. It's all about that's balance, exactly people. It is. Yeah. That's right. I didn't mean to imply that your mom was shacking up with your stepdad. <laughs> <laughs> you, t- <laughs> you absolutely did. You did not. You all but called her bad names. Well, no, he just said they never married, so I just assumed Correct. that they lived together. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's okay. But I'm, I'm sorry, no, Joel. They, no, <laughs> we're good. You have to work a lot harder to offend me. How about that? All right. All ramp, right. It, ramp it up, honey. Ramp it up. All right. I got That's you. Right. I got Challenge you. accepted. Yeah, I got plenty of time. So. Don't panic. Don't panic. Mm-hmm. That's right. Okay. So you got married when you were around 19. Mm-hmm. Two beautiful daughters. Yep. You were married about eight and a half years. Correct. You get divorced. Yep. You meet your lovely wife that becomes the best stepmom in the world ever. Correct. The kids live with the bio mom. Correct. That hasn't always been the case. Their living arrangement has changed throughout the time period since the divorce. When we first divorced, they lived with their mom full time and I got them every other weekend. And then after a couple of years, her circumstances changed. And so we changed the living arrangements to where they went back and forth each week. Okay. Uh, I guess that was probably, I don't even know, five or six years ago now. Mm -hmm. And then my older daughter went to live with her mom 
about a year and a half ago. Okay. My younger daughter decided to go live with her mom about four months ago. And when the older one went to live with her mom, I knew it was only a matter of time before the younger one decided to as well. Because when their mom and I split up, we all still live in the same little town. We live in a town of less than 30,000 people. Everybody knows everybody. When we divorced, each of us moved around to different places in the town. They got Her mom got an apartment for a while, and then she moved into a house, and then to a different house. And I moved into a house with a roommate for a while. And, and the only constant my two girls had was each other. Mm -hmm. each other and the school they went to. Those are the only things that never, ever changed. And so, uh, again, when the older one went to live with her mom, I knew it was only a matter of time because the other thing is they have a little brother at their mom's house. Their mom and their stepdad have a son together. He is now about five, I think. Mm -hmm. And so the younger daughter, on the weeks she was over here, she missed her sister. She missed her brother. And so that's one of the various reasons why she went to go live with her mom. There's more to it than that, but that's one of the, you know, that's one of the, the factors in it. And so again, their, their living situation has changed. So how often do you see them now? Every few days. It kind of depends. They normally come over for dinner once or twice a week. Sometimes I'll see them at, at various sporting events. My older daughter played travel soccer and I was the head coach. So I saw her a couple of days a week this fall when we had practices or games. The younger daughter played volleyball, so I would go watch her volleyball matches and sometimes take her home from them. You know, now she's a cheerleader, so I go watch her cheer at basketball games or whatever it is. And uh, sometimes she needs a ride home after a basketball game that I maybe didn't get to attend or whatever it is. So I, I would say on average, I see them probably two or three times uh, a week. Sometimes it's not that much. Sometimes it's more, but that's probably a good average. Do they ever stay with you, like spend the night over the weekend? or The older one has only spent the night over here probably twice in the past year. And those were extraordinary circumstances. Mm -hmm. And the younger one has not spent the night over here since she went to go live with her mom. That's something that we're talking about mm -hmm. getting back into. Because uh, again, part of the part of the reason too was we just we had some pretty serious breakdowns in our relationship, and um, a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of that had to do with me being harsh with them when they were younger, mm -hmm. and um, and so they felt like what they needed was space away from me to work on some of their own emotional kind of things. Right. And so I'm trying to give them that. Now, I will fully admit I didn't like that when it first happened. Of course not. I felt like I was, you know, I felt like I was scapegoated a little bit, whether that's true or not. That's how I felt. On the other hand, if my daughters really do feel like they struggle to be around me, I don't want to force them into a situation that they feel like is damaging to them when maybe what they do need is a little time and space. Right. You don't want to make the relationship worse. That's right. I don't want to damage it now to where they don't talk to me till they're 30. Exactly. You know, I, I miss them and I would love to see them every day. I'd love for them to spend half their lives here till they graduate and go to college. On the other hand, what I really want is I want them to call me when they need something two years from now or five years from now or 10 years from now. I don't want them to just not ever speak to their dad because he was harsh with them and didn't give them the space they needed when they were teenagers. Right. So it's trying to keep a long-term perspective, which is not always easy. No, it's not. So I have a question for you. Did you feel like your kids didn't want to live with you and your wife because, I don't want to say of your wife, but of the stepmom? No, it, it had nothing to do with her at all. It was, if anything, it was 100% me that they didn't want to live with. Okay. It was, it, it had nothing to do with her. Um, again, one of the things I'm thankful for is that even when they have, uh, even when they moved out, it was hard on, like it hurt us, obviously. It's hard not to take that kind of thing personally. I don't want to live with you. On the other hand, they have always been consistently kind and respectful towards my wife. And I'm very grateful for that. Again, it's, it's harder to maintain a closeness when they're not here, mm -hmm. but they've always been, they've been good to her, uh, which I've appreciated. And she's always been, like I said, she, she is a saint. I'm telling you what, I don't know the official process for nominating people for sainthood. <laughs> I don't know if Presbyterians get to do that in the Catholic church. <laughs> um, but if you, if you can, I know somebody. So you can always buy a sword off of Amazon and knight her. You know? That's true. So, That's true. I don't. Do you knight women? Um, I don't know, but you could start. How does that, I know you can get a knighthood like Dame Judy <clears throat> Dench. But. Yeah. This girl that we know that was in the academy, she bought her husband some knighthood things. So his name is legally, quote, quote, Lord Darcy. Nice. You should do that for me. I want you to call me <laughs> Sir David Mix a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I told my wife she can call me the Grand Poobah. She there you go. Do it. Absolutely. Grand Exalted Poobah. I like that as well. That's fine. <laughs> uh, 
you know. Perfect. Sometimes when I'm driving her crazy, she goes, my Lord. And I go, you don't have to call me that. That's going to be a little too hard. <laughs> and, then, and then I duck because, ooh. Yeah, I know. As I, if her button wasn't already pushed. I was probably five years old before I realized my name really wasn't Jesus. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. What is it? The uh, there was no there was a comedian who used to say, you know, until he was ten years old, he thought his name was Stop That, <laughs> you know, yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I can't yeah. say what my mama said. I know. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly right. Yes. <laughs> Got to edit that out. She never knew if she was talking to her or the dog. That's all I'm saying. There you go. <gasps> That's exactly right. <laughs> David, he meant saying things like "Stop it! Stop chewing on that! Stop peeing on the floor!" You know, she still pees on the floor. Joe, look at this! <laughs> you are an enabler. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all see this brohood thing going on? Oh, let's get David out of Shame. trouble. I have to save my button pushing friend. Hmm? <laughs> That's a great phrase. My my button pushing friend. That's better than yeah. some things you could say. <laughs> button pushing husband of mine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's I see it. That's gonna happen now, David. Sorry. <laughs> yep. Yep. You're in trouble. <laughs> so what's your relationship like with your ex? It's pretty good. Um, I'm very thankful. We've worked really hard over the past 10 years to try to create a constructive co-parenting relationship. And what I don't want to do is make it sound like it's always been butterflies and roses because that would be quite far from the truth. There were times when we had really angry words with each other. There were times when we had harsh words. There were times when we had to sit down with a mediator because we couldn't speak terribly civilly to each other. We didn't ever do that. I'm very thankful to say in front of our kids, not that I can remember. I can't ever remember having a giant, angry, that kind of thing in front of our kids after our divorce. But it hasn't always been easy because, again, we're divorced, right. which means we don't see things the same way. Mm -hmm. We didn't see things the same way when we were married. We definitely don't see them the same way now. And, and the thing is, what we've both had to do is learn to reconcile the fact that we can't always have things our own way. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of the things that I try to teach people is you, even in a traditional mar first marriage, however you want to put it, any marriage, you're never going to get things always the way you want them. If you do, that marriage isn't going to last. I mean, that's, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so once you're divorced, you absolutely are not going to get things your own way all the time. Mm -hmm. So the question is not, how do you fix that and get things your own way? The question is, how do you respond? How do you give way graciously? How do you come to compromises? How do you work together when you disagree to pursue a common goal? Those are some of the kind of commandments that we talked about on when you guys came on my podcast. We talk about the idea of being as consistent as possible. Well, if you disagree about the specifics, what you should be able to be consistent about is the values. Right? You want your kid to be honest, respectful, kind, loving, hardworking. I've never met anyone who says, I want my kid to be a smart aleck, lazy turd who takes no personal responsibility. Nobody says that. No, but the thing is, even if you disagree about the specifics, you ought to be able to agree with the values or agree about the, the big idea. So like one of the examples I use is if you, you want your kids to get enough rest to be healthy, right? So when your kids are school age, you want them to go to bed at a decent time. You may disagree about what a decent time is, but you both want your kids to get enough rest. So like my girls went to bed later at their mom's house than they did at my house. And it wasn't because I loved them more or their mom loved them less. It was because they were able to sleep in more at their mom's house because they didn't have to get up as early. At our house, I get up super early. I am a morning person. And I'm telling you, when my feet hit the floor, I am awake and ready to go. I get out of bed singing and dancing and like I'm ready to go. And it drives people crazy. I'd shoot you. And I'm a morning person. <laughs> but dude, I look, my brother and sister, when we were kids, they would be like, shut up. <laughs> and I, I can't help it. This is just me early in the morning. Now, after the sun goes down, I'm done. Yeah, I was fixing to say, I'll be in there at midnight singing and dancing and waking. <laughs> yeah. See, we're complete opposite. You can tell when we do the intros and outros fairly late in the evening because mm -hmm. I just don't have that gumption. Yeah. Don't have quite the same level. Yeah. It's, I'm tired. I'm done. I'm wore out, you know, because I wake up, I'm gone like you. Yep. I don't run around singing though, but well, not yet. It might yeah. happen. You should. It's fun. People love it. But come 10 o'clock at night, I'm done. I'm useless. Oh, yeah. And I'm hitting second gear. Yeah. I tell her, I say, well, honey, we stayed up till the double digits. That's late. <laughs> <laughs> that's past my bedtime. It's true. What are you talking about? Yeah. So, yeah, so that's the thing is that that's the way that I've always been. And so at my house, I got up early and I'd be knocking around the house getting ready. So they would wake up earlier. So that means they had to go to bed earlier at their mom's house. She's more of a night owl. So they would all stay up later together 
And then they could sleep in in the morning and still get to school on time. Right. So it didn't matter if their bedtime was later over there. That's not a fight worth having. The question is, were they getting enough rest to where they were functioning well in school? They were healthy. They were happy. The answer is yes. Okay, so there's no disagreement in terms of the value. Does that make sense? I get that. I just know that between my ex and I, the values Mm -hmm. are completely different day and night. So let's just say, for instance, I don't cuss around my son. Mm -hmm. Okay. His dad does. Okay. It can bother me all day long. Talking to him about it is only going to make him cuss more. Yep. There's nothing I can do about it. It is out of my control. Correct. 100% correct. What I can do is teach my son that I don't think Mm -hmm. that that's proper and that he's not going to talk like that in my house. Correct. Which I don't think my son talks like that at his dad's either, but who knows, man? I don't know. I'm not there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) David. (laughs) So in another instance, it's kind of like with David's ex, it was the same thing. She was living with somebody Mm -hmm. and wasn't married. Mm -hmm. And David and I waited till we got married because we didn't want our kids to think it was okay to shack up. Right. You know, like I was implying your mom did. (laughs) (laughs) Uh Oh. Mom, if you ever listen to this, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, again, there's nothing David could do about that. Correct. Yeah. Other than tell his kids without saying bad things about their mom. Right. Without bad mouthing them. Right. Mm-hmm. Just saying, I don't agree with that. Right. Right. We are choosing to do it this way. And here is why. But no, you did that. You're exactly right. All you can do is you can live the right way or what you believe to be the right way and set the good example. And you tell them, here's why we do it this way, because we believe this is the best because of X, Y, and Z, whatever your reasons are. And you're right. That's that's all you can do. That's another one of the commandments that we talk about is model maturity and wisdom. Yes. What does that look like? For you, maturity and wisdom looks like we, we don't use foul language in this house mm-hmm. because we believe that if you can't get your point across without using profanity, you just need a better vocabulary. Mm-hmm. So let's work on your vocabulary. That's a quote from John Wooden. He said, uh, the UCLA basketball coach from years ago, that's kind of the, that's something that he implied. He goes, I never had to use profanity because if you have to use profanity to get your point across, it just means you don't know enough words. So I do have a funny side story. It has nothing to do with step families, but it has something to do with- nice. um, Foul language. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Please, God, don't let it be about me. No, it's not. (laughs) It's it's actually, um, I had a... I'll tell you the story about when my kids cussed the first time. It's fun. No, I'm good. We'll get that. I had a a doctor I was dealing with one time. There was a client of mine I was building a website for years ago. Mm -hmm. And basically the short of it was that the doctor's son was heading up the project, telling me how he wanted the website built and all that. And we got to the very end of the project. The doctor steps in and says, I don't like any of it. Start over. <laughs> and I was like, uh, no, I'm not starting over unless you're going to pay double. Right. And so he's like, no, I'm not paying you anymore. You didn't do it the way I wanted it done. You know, he just goes on and on. And I'm like, well, sounds to me like uh, you need to hire somebody different. And he proceeds to cuss me up one side and down the other. I mean, it was, wow. it was, it was so bad that I had, I was like laughing inside. I was like, I've never been cussed <laughs> out this bad. This is actually entertaining. Well done <laughs> to you. Sir. I know. And I'm sitting, he's just a getting it. And I, I remember I was at like an athletic shoe store or something. I was picking out shoes and I was like, dude, this guy's ripping me a new one. And were you on the phone with him? Yeah, I was okay. on the phone with him. So he just he goes on and on and on. He for like two solid minutes and he finally stops and I said, you know, it's it's amazing and yet sad that you have a doctorate degree and your vocabulary is that bad. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, um, anyway, I'm not changing my mind, so bye. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 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 But uh fun it was it was funny. Yeah. And to be fair, listeners, please don't hear me trying to be holier than thou. There are plenty of times when I've said words I should not have said. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. My son will tell you. Yeah. No, well, he exaggerates, too. That's a whole nother <laughs> well, perception. Ch- wait a minute. Children exaggerate? Yes. My kids would never do that. The students that I teach would never do that. Did you know that if you said, I'm pissed off, it's as bad as saying the F-bomb? I did not know that. According to my son, it is. Well, did you also know that if you don't cook a five-course meal every day, that you're actually starving the kid to death? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did know that. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I did. Or if you or if you don't buy them fast food every time they demand it, then you're just a terrible parent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and God forbid, don't buy those 
high sodium frozen meals for them to eat. Mm-hmm. No, no, absolutely do. My son told the doctor that, that I'm killing him with high sodium frozen meals. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we talk about that in class all the time. I'm like, the kids ask me, like, do your kids get an allowance? I'm like, yeah, I allow them to go to a private school that I pay for. I allow them to eat the food that I bought. I allow yeah. them to wear the clothes that I paid for. They get an allowance. Oh, I love that, Joel. Mm -hmm. You just got a brownie point back from the button pushing. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So tell us about your kids cousin. (laughs) (laughs) I can't miss that part. Uh, Oh, so my younger daughter grew up like a lot of little girls do. She thought she was a Disney princess. Okay. And so one day she's probably three. She's sitting in the bathtub and like three inches of water splashing around. I'm in the next room. I'm folding some laundry or whatever. And she's pretending to be Cinderella. So, you know, you'd take a washcloth and get it wet and try to stick it to the tile side of a bathtub. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, that fascinates kids because it sticks to the wall and doesn't fall down. Yeah. Well, she's sitting there and she gets it wet and she's sticking it would fall down and you hear it splash and she tries to stick it and you hear it fall down. And one time it fell down and you heard from the bathroom, you just heard her go, damn it. <laughs> and, I, and I walked in the bathroom and I looked at her and I said, baby, what did you say? And she went, <laughs> and her eyes got real big and her mouth got real pursed and that look on her face where she went, oh, I don't know, but that wasn't right. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, obviously something I should have said. <laughs> that's exa- And she's shaking her head like, no, I didn't say anything at all. And so I'm looking at her and said, um, baby, that's not a word that we want to say. Where did you hear that? And she didn't really answer. And I leaned in very quietly. I said, did you hear that from dad? Because if the answer is yes, I don't want her mom to hear that. <laughs> So I said very quietly, did you hear that bad word from your dad? She went, no. I'm like, yes. So I said very loudly, did you hear that cuss word you just said from your mom? You know? And she goes, no. And I thought, well, crap. I said, well, did you hear it from grandpa? Because my dad was still alive then. And he was military. So that's uh-huh. part of his vocabulary. And literally, literally the week before we've been driving in the car, we're driving down the road and dad says something about shit. I said, dad, Cardi's in the backseat. He went, right. Damn it. Sorry. This is not helpful. Right. Dad, dad, that was not helpful. So I said, did you hear that from grandpa? She went, no. I said, baby. Okay. So the thing is, that's just a word we don't want to say. Where did you hear that? She goes, well, and yeah, you can see the wheels turning in a little kid's brain. Like you can see through their eyeballs. Mm -hmm. She looks up and she goes, well, I just think Jesus told it to (laughs) (laughs) me. <laughs> and I said, No, baby, I am quite confident he did not. She went, Yep, he did. Jesus told it to me. <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, we well, see, so at least if nothing else, she's been paying attention in Sunday school. So I guess that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's probably where she heard it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. Because she probably was like, God looked at Moses and was like, "Mm." (laughs) 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 This is so funny. My son, well, two stories real quick. We were riding down the road one night and it was kind of late. We had stayed at the auction with David, but we left before David did. And Jackson said, what time is it? And I said, it's like 10 o'clock. He goes, damn. And I said, Jackson. (laughs) He said, another word my daddy says, I shouldn't, huh? (laughs) (laughs) I said, yep. <laughs> okay. Add that to the list. Good to know. That's awesome. Uh, now, he was probably two, two and a half, I guess, when I heard him playing in his room, kind of like your daughter, you know, playing. Mm-hmm. And I kept hearing, take that. You take that. And I walk in there and he's got his little Jesus figurine tearing Moses up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, he's just beating Moses to a pulp. And I'm like, no, no, uh, no, stop, stop. That's just not nice. <laughs> I don't think that's what Jesus, he did overturn some tables in the temple, but he didn't really, he didn't show up and beat up Moses on the Mount of yeah. Transfigurate. Like that's not, that's a different that's testament. That's really funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jackson's that testament. Exactly, that's, oh my goodness. <laughs> that is fantastic. That's the new, new testament. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was thinking about uh, it just, uh, you know, these goofy uh, things that happen in our blended families and, and they make for great stories. Um, but one of the big things that I've learned that I really want to share with people is actually something that I learned from my older daughter back when she was in, I don't know, kindergarten or whatever. She she made a, a great illustration for this. And, and um, what happened is she was, it was like kindergarten or preschool graduation. And first of all, I don't know why that's a thing. Like, <laughs> how do you graduate preschool? You, what you, you didn't eat beyond the required amount of paste. Yeah. So anyway, she's at her kindergarten, preschool, graduation, whatever it was. It was a great little program. I just, I think it's dumb to have graduation for that, whatever. Um, and so the teacher who we love to death, Miss Susie, Miss Susie would say something about each of the students when they got their 
diploma that they, you know, most of them couldn't even read. And so she'd say, little Johnny would help me pick up toys every day. And it just made my heart happy. And little Sarah, every day when she came in, would give me a hug. And that made my heart happy. And then she, <laughs> and then she got to my kid and she said, little Carly was my teacher helper. <laughs> and as a, as a school teacher, my ears pricked up. I thought, oh, this ought to be good. And so, <laughs> and so she said, whenever the students didn't want to do their work, Carly would look at them and she would say, sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do because that's life. <laughs> <laughs> and she's three years old. And as the teacher's saying this, Carly's sitting in the pew in the church and she's just nodding her head. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I thought, good. At least she heard something I've said. Yeah. Because she heard that every day of her life, her and her younger sister, both baby, I need you to pick this up. I don't want to. Did I ask? Yes. Sometimes you got to do stuff you don't want to do. Pick it up. Well, in blended families, you have to do things you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be unfair? Yes. Are you going to get the short end of the stick sometimes? Yes. Can you do anything about it? Probably not. Tough luck. Right. You just got to deal. You, you got to make the best of it. That's all you can do. And the sooner you accept that, the closer you are to being happy. Right. Or happier or less miserable. That's what we say. Once you stop trying to be a nuclear family, life gets better. Yeah. Quit trying to be something you're not. Yep. Agreed. And it's okay not to be a nuclear or traditional family. Right. It doesn't mean that you're tainted. Right. Yeah. It just is different. And how about what I'm hoping for is that in the next generation, there won't be quite such a stigma around blended families. Now, obviously, in a perfect world, people wouldn't get divorced. Now, there would still be blended families because of a, a partner passing away and leaving someone as a widow or a widower. So step families have always been a thing. I mean, there's, there's step families all over the Bible. There's step families all throughout history. Some good, some less so. But that's when the step mom became the mom that's most of the time, legally and yeah. everything. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, and again, there's a lot of negative stereotypes associated with that. Again, like for my daughters, they grew up watching Cinderella. Mm -hmm. And so the first idea of a step mom is the evil step. Like that's her title. And so one of the things that one of the greatest memories we have is before we got married, my wife and I took the girls out to dinner one night. I think it was for my wife's birthday. And I put the kids on the spot and I said, I want you to just say something nice about Mel. That's what they call her. So they have mom and they have Mel. So short for Mary Ellen. I said, I just want you to say something nice about Mel. And, uh, and Carly, the older one, looked at her and said, I'm just very thankful because I know that you're not going to be an evil stepmom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and coming from a kid who was raised on Cinderella, had the sparkly gowns, had the fake plastic shoes, had the wands, had everything, like that's about as high a compliment as you can get from a little girl. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that let us know, okay, there, we're, we know we're going to hit bumps in the road, but we also know there's going to be good that's going to be able to come out of this. Yes. So I would encourage you guys that are listening, hold on to those moments, write them down somewhere. One of the things that we've done in our home, and we did this more when the girls lived with us, but we've done it for years is we would keep an empty mason jar on a shelf in the den and next to it, we would keep a notepad and a pen or a pencil. And throughout the year, anytime anything good happened, could be big, could be tiny, we would just go write a note, put it in the mason jar. And then around New Year's, we would get the jar out and pull these things out and just read back through the memories of the previous year. And some were sweet and some were a little bit sad and some were bittersweet. Some of them were just hysterical. <laughs> and it was a great way to remind ourselves that, okay, we had some great moments in the past year together. We had some wonderful time. And a lot of them were things that we had already forgotten about. But when you read it, it was like, oh my goodness, that was so much fun. I hope you kept all those. We do. We, my wife put them in a file somewhere. Yeah, we've got good. And, and it. But it's just, a, it's a simple thing, but it's a great reminder that, listen, on the days when life is hard and it sucks and it hurts, go back and look at the positive things. So like right now, my younger daughter and I are struggling. I'll just be completely honest and vulnerable with everybody listening. And my daughters, if you listen to this, I know that you know, but I'm going to tell you anyway, I love you always, no matter what. But we're struggling right now, my younger daughter and I, okay? On the days when I'm struggling, one of the things that I'm very thankful for is a gift that I was given years ago that it's actually on my desk here where we're doing an interview. It was a post-it note that my daughter wrote to me that my wife had made into a coaster. And so I put my coffee cup on it. And it's a note from my younger daughter. And it says, I love you, daddy. And you too, Mel, you are both great. Lou, Aww. even on the days when she just doesn't want to speak to me, I know that there are times that my daughter and I get along really well. Most of the book, I, I read about six books at a time in different rooms of the house. Almost every bookmark I own is a note from one of my kids or from my wife. That's beautiful. That's what I use for bookmarks because it's just a way to remind me on the days that suck, I know that my kids love me. I know that if they don't like me right now, they did at one point and they probably will again at some point in the future. And so, again, I want to encourage you guys, keep those reminders. I'm so glad you have those reminders 
the reminders I have from my son are post-it notes that say, I eat dog crap. <laughs> That's fine. That's just as good because you can use that as blackmail as he gets older. He put it on my desk <laughs> one day and now it's taped up on there with duct tape. Nice. So he's saying you do or he's saying he does? I was not asking. <laughs> okay. That's all I got to say, but it's still up there. That's fantastic. There's no telling with him. He, he unfortunately does things because I do it. Uh oh. He has learned that there is a certain enjoyment out of getting certain reactions out of people. The hereditary button pushing. <laughs> yes. Let's explain this to the listeners. See, there's what you call. What had happened was. Nurture in nature, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Things that my son has from his, I guess, genetic makeup from his father. Mm -hmm. And then things that David has taught him. Mm hmm. No, that, that's not true because teaching somebody means you've you've like set them down and said this is no, how you no, do no, it. No, 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 no. So you can would, teach people I would love by to your agree actions. with that, David, but I can't. I, I would. I would right. love to back you up on that, but I cannot. All right. So thanks for joining us today, Joel. And, uh, <laughs> Man, I, I thought it was going to be Lori that cut me off. <laughs> All right. Well, I owe my wife ten bucks now. All right. <laughs> good to know. It is important for us to remember those good times. Yeah. But as you're saying that, I'm like, oh, that's great. I'm going to share that with my group, if that's okay mm. with you. Please do. That that's, that's something that they can do is have, you know, yeah. a good moment jar or yeah. something like that. And that was 100% my wife's idea. I'm not that creative or intelligent. So we know that. It's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Okay, so I'm thinking about this, and I'm like, yeah, that's great. I'm going to tell you know the people in my Facebook group. Mm -hmm. That's something good that they can do. Yeah. So when they are struggling and want to go hide in the closet or run away and sell goat cheese on the side of a mountain, right. they'll have those things yep. to bring them back. Yep. And I'm thinking, if we would have done that with David's kids, I cannot imagine what crap we would have found in that jar later. Right. Because... A few of them are button pushers. Yeah. Um, I can see something like Lori yelled at us. Right. In there, almost like a complaint jar. It turned into a complaint <laughs> jar. A little bit. But again, in the long term, though, it would still be because looking back now, it'd be funny. Yes. Because you look at you go, Lori yelled at us. I probably said, go clean your room. That's probably what actually happened. Yeah. But they wrote down Lori yelled at, you know what I mean? Yeah. Honestly, I do already. I already feel a bit sorry for my son's future wives. Because... <laughs> <laughs> because I know every one of my sons has seen the button pushing I do to Lori, and yeah. they're honestly looking forward to it. That's exactly right. That's why you get married, so you can annoy the same person the rest of your life. Learn how to do it better. So, Joel, I may have told you, may have told you this on your podcast, but my oldest son used to say all the time when he was younger that he was writing a book on the uh, 101 things not to say to your wife. Nice. <laughs> every time I would say something to Lori that was... Caused but, a great reaction. But, button pushing. Uh -huh. He would sit there and hold his hand up and act like he was writing on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. He should actually write that book. Like that would be a book that would sell tons of copies. I, I'm just saying. I know. I told him, I, I said, one day, son, I will make you rich. That's exactly right. And you're welcome. I think it turned into a thousand and one things yeah, before think, he left. Yeah, I think he figured I blew 101 out pretty yes, quickly. Exactly. So. Well, then look, that's <laughs> when you write a series of 101, 101 more. Right? right. 101 things for Monday. There you go. That's exactly Tuesday. right. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. Perfect. That's exactly it. Well, Joel, tell us a little bit about your podcast and your ministry and what you do besides tell kids that they're dumb. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I do that and they pay me for it and it's awesome. I know. That uh, is amazing. He actually gets paid to dig up the past. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you for asking. I um, I have a ministry that I call 10, the number 10, CBF, and that stands for the 10 Commandments for Blended Families. That's the core of everything that I teach, and it's something that I came up with about three or four years ago, and it's basically what I learned in my time as part of a blended family for most of my life. A lot of it I learned by doing it badly and realizing that was stupid. Or I learned it by observing other people doing it well, like my parents did. So those, you know, and those teachings are, they're online. You can find them on my website. You can download the list of the, the Ten Commandments for Blended Families. Like, um, But the, what I do is uh, I've got our podcast and, and you guys were wonderful on it, by the way. That was, I don't know if I've laughed that much in, in any episode so far. <laughs> um, but the, the podcast is aimed at helping and encouraging all different kinds of blended families. And so what we do, what I do each week is I interview um, experts about their experience in blended families and what they do and which of the 10 commandments they feel like people do the worst or which ones they struggle with the most. And it's fun because I've gotten lots of different answers because again, 
different people see things differently. And so the whole point of the podcast is to encourage blended families by providing them with other resources that they can check out. Because again, just like with with doctors or teachers or whatever, some people you just click with and other people you meet, you kind of go, I mean, they're a nice person. I just, we don't jibe for whatever reason. And so when people listen to my podcast, I want to introduce them to a lot of other resources because maybe that's the one that they're going to connect with. Maybe it's like you guys with Nacho Kids. Maybe it's another blended family coach. Maybe it's a therapist. Maybe it's a counselor, maybe it's a pastor, whatever it is. But I want to introduce people to lots of different resources for blended families because, again, you guys know, ten years ago, a lot of this stuff wasn't here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There, there just there weren't. If you if you walked into a bookstore and looked for a book about what it's like to be in a blended family ten years ago, you weren't going to find a whole lot. Thankfully, that's starting to change, um, and I think a lot of it is because of people like you guys and your, your podcast and your program just making it well known. One, this is a common situation. Two, we have some experience with it. So three, let us help you figure out how to navigate it. And that, that's the same kind of stuff that I do. Um, I also do some individual blended family coaching. Um, so if people are, are looking to get more in depth into, okay, these 10 commandments sound really good, but I'm not sure they're going to work for my, I'm not sure how they'd work in my family, right? Mm -hmm. That's the good thing about commandments. They work for everybody, but you may not understand how to apply them in your family. And so if you want more in depth on those, that's what I do is I'll, you know, work with people. We do video conferences, phone calls, text messaging, emails, whatever works best for you guys. And, and I provide people with um, some blended family coaching. Um, I also am very blessed. I've been able to speak at various events National Head Start Association, different church conferences, marriage, that kind of stuff. Because unfortunately, if you look up, you know, any 10 random marriage conferences online, almost none of them are going to have a specific speaker who talks about blended families. And as you guys well know, what works in a first family does not always translate well to a blended family. And so you have all these couples who are remarried who go to these marriage conferences and they're only getting about half out of it what they should because everything they hear is like, well, that sounds really good, but that would have been good to know in my first marriage, a little bit late for that now. Can you help me with this one? And and so most conferences don't do that. And I'm I'm not sure why, but I have a suspicion. My suspicion is if you're having a marriage conference, you don't want to seem like you are supporting divorce. And so if you have a, if you have a conference that's aimed at marriage and you say, we have this speaker who's specifically going to talk to blended family issues, it's almost people are going to assume that you think divorce is a good idea or something like that. And because I ha- actually, I've had churches tell me that when I've said, I'd like to come to your church and do this presentation, they go, we don't really we don't really want you to come do that because we don't want to seem like we are endorsing divorce. I'm like, have you asked your congregation? 40% of the people in your church are in a blended family, whether you know it or not. No, they don't want to talk about it. Yeah. You don't have to endorse divorce. It's already here. The question Mm -hmm. is, are you doing anything to stop another one from happening? No. That's the, and the answer, and unfortunately at a lot of churches, the answer is no. And that's where, Mm -hmm. I try to talk to the pastor and we talk about our theology and I talk about my own. I end up having to share my story a gajillion times because every single church wants to know your theology and wants to know your stance on marriage. And that's totally valid. I get that. You want to protect your flock. Totally good. But at some point, I think America's churches are going to have to understand blended families are here and we need to be helping them, not just pretending they don't exist and hoping that our marriage ministry also works for them. Yes. Because spoiler alert, it doesn't. Preach, Joel, preach. (laughs) If it did, we wouldn't have 40% of our congregations who are already divorced and remarried. Exactly. That's a lot of what I do. You are not the first person that I've heard say that about (laughs) the churches. To be completely fair, like I'm a lifelong Christian. I teach at a small Christian school. I'm thankful for my salvation in Jesus Christ. But I do think that that that's one big gaping hole that a lot of American churches have in their ministry. And a lot of times they don't want to have speakers or conferences that are about things that aren't really positive. Correct. So they don't want a bunch of divorced people that are remarried up there complaining about their stepkids. Right. Yeah. Even though the That's, end yep. goal is to teach them that there can be success and That's there right. can be a blend and it can be better than you thought it would be, but right. different. Yeah. And that's what and that's what a lot of the people in the congregation need to hear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you're right. Churches a lot of times don't want to do that. Unless right. you've been in a blended family, though. Yeah, you don't know. Well, you probably think we already have something for families. Right. That's exactly you know, right. We're already doing a family conference. That's Why right. do we need to do something specific yep. for blended families? You're the same, right? Uh, and so they don't know. Yeah. And that's, that, again, that's one of the things that I share with people when they are 
getting remarried, I tell them, listen, you need to find a someone to do your premarital counseling who has worked with blended families. Because again, no offense to any pastor, therapist, counselor out there, but if you don't have any experience with blended families, you're not actually going to be that much help. I'm not saying the pastor has to be divorced and remarried. What I am saying is that pastor should have some experience with helping blended families with their specific family issues. So like when my wife and I got married, our pastor is still married to the same lady that he married 30 some odd years ago, right? But he has worked with lots of other blended families. And so this is a great resource I recommend to everybody. The first thing he gave us was Ron Deal's book, The Smart Step Family. And so that was our premarital counseling was to read that book together a chapter at a time, talk about it. Because he knew going into a second marriage is not the same as going into a first marriage. Right. He was wise enough to know that. And we talk about too that, yeah, you want someone that has experience with blended families, Mm -hmm. but a lot of times you truly need somebody that has truly experienced it themselves. Right. Firsthand experience. Right. Yeah. I was hesitant to go to the counselor that David and I went to because Mm -hmm. he hadn't been in a blended family. It's like you. He was a preacher. He'd been married to his wife for umpteen number of years. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know if he's going to get it. And that's where you just have to be careful because I see both sides of that Mm -hmm. because, yeah, I've had that exact same conversation. And and actually, I wrote about that in a a leadership book that I wrote years ago. There's a difference between experiential knowledge and book knowledge, Mm -hmm. right? And it's not that one is necessarily better because there are certain things that, yes, you may only learn through experience. You can't learn how to hit a baseball by reading a book about the physiology of hitting a baseball. Right. It's very different to, to look at a diagram versus standing in the batter's box. Yeah. I heard a quote recently that um, you can only impact others to the degree you've been impacted. Mm-hmm. And so I've, I've thought about that. And I think that might be a good measure that people can use. You can tell pretty quickly, has something impacted somebody's life mm-hmm. to a degree that you feel like they can turn around and impact yours. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good phrase. All right, so Joel, you asked us three questions. Uh oh. Yeah, the ones you shot down. Oh my goodness, did she ever? Man. <laughs> yeah, she was cruel. Cool. <laughs> well, I thought you would at least change them up since it was a retake. No, I didn't want to do that. That sounds like a lot of work. He has a standard. <laughs> he, he's following a format. Now, I, I asked the same questions for all of season one and season two. Uh, I'll probably change it up after that. We'll see. I, so, I suggest you do. <laughs> so, do you have questions? <laughs> I do. But mine are pretty bad. That's all right. Because I, I tried to think of them as we were talking, which means I was multitasking, which means I was only halfway doing mm-hmm. both things. Yeah, you were half. Halfway is not the term my father would have used. So what would be your favorite or your dream car? Oh, man. Uh, 1966 red Ford Mustang convertible. There you go. My first car was a 68 red Mustang that my dad and I bought together. And I loved that car. And then I sold it when my first kid was born because my wife didn't like the idea of a car seat in the back of a 35-year-old automobile. Okay. What's your favorite food? Uh, buffalo wings, specifically from a restaurant in town here called Jefferson's. Oh. That's, why, that's why I asked you about buffalo wings versus boneless nuggets, which are not a real thing. Boneless wings are not a real thing. They're just, they're just. Chicken nuggets. It's chicken breast. It can be shaped like one. It is not. It's shaped like a nugget. It can be shaped like a wing. They that choose to shape it, it like a, a nugget. I could be shaped like a dog. Doesn't make me a dog. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on now. <laughs> All right. And I'm leaving the last question impromptu, David. What? Asking the third question. Oh, you want question. me to just come up with something? Yeah, I, I did. I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> Favorite dog. Favorite breed of dog. Uh, anything, uh, bull associated pit bull, bulldog, whatever. Like we have two, we've got a pit bull mix and a bulldog mix and they're both bull mastiff. We do not have a bull mastiff, but that would be awesome. (laughs) That dog would be bigger than I am. Now, what is it? What what is your spirit animal? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. What's your spirit? (laughs) My my spirit animal is my dog bruiser. Um, he is, he is a bulldog mix. He's got scars all over him. He slobbers when he drinks. He is, um, he's not terribly well mannered. When he is sweet, he is a wonderful dog. When he acts like a fool, you just want to put him in the backyard for about a month. Mm-hmm. And, and and like we got Bruiser a couple years ago and we almost got rid of him. And, and that's terrible because he's a rescue dog. And we said, if we get a rescue dog, we're never getting rid of them no matter what. He almost drove my wife crazy. We had to go like immediately sign him up for obedience classes. And I cannot tell you how much I identify with that dog. So my sp- so did she send you for obedience classes too? Oh, I took him. It was for both of us. Okay, it, good. <laughs> it was for both of us. 
Oh yeah. Oh, so it yeah. helps your marriage a lot. It really did. And it honestly, it truly did. It helped because he was less awful and because I was less awful. And so we were less awful together. That's great. But I'm telling you, bruiser is my spirit animal. Well, Joe, how can people find you? Thank you for asking. You can find me on my website at Joel W. Hallbaker. That's H-A-W-B-A-K-E-R. Joel W. Hallbaker.com, reallifeleading.com or stepdadding.com. You can also find me on social media on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, uh, just under my name, Joel W. Hallbaker. Uh, or you can find the podcast called 10CBF. You can find that on Anchor, Spotify, iTunes, whatever. So contact me through any of those places. I would love to chat with you about whatever you'd like to chat about. We can talk about bulldogs. We can talk about sports. <laughs> we can talk about new and interesting ways to push your spouse's buttons. I knew you were going to say that. That's because it's important. It is important. Okay, it's going to be davidandjoelhaters.com. If you're going to start a Joel Haters, you need to, you need to buckle up because take a number. There are a lot of people <laughs> out there going to be on that list. Most of them are going to be former students. Yeah, I tell the kids every year, I'm like, listen, if you don't like me, take a number. It's a long line. Wraps around the building. Doesn't hurt my feelings. Maybe we can change the... The 10 CBF, maybe we can make it stand for like uh, 10 Continental Button Pushing Foundation or something like <laughs> nice. that. Nice. All right. I'm sure, there's, I'm sure there's an acronym we can work in there. That'll be good. <laughs> All right, Joel. It's been great having you on the podcast, and we'll uh, circle back with you in the future to see how things are going with you. Thanks again. That sounds great. Thank you guys very much. I've had a great time as always, and I know that it'll be a lot of fun next time we chat as well. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was Joel. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, when you realize people are a button pusher, your attitude towards them changes. Really? Yeah. Well, what do you want me to say? Oh, Joe, thank you for being on our podcast and pushing my buttons, you dear soul. That's much better. Oh, please. <laughs> that reminds me of this time. Brief story. I had a job that I had to deal with salesmen. Okay. Apparently, the salesman needed to be coddled. So I got a lecture on, you need to be more friendly with them and ask them how their day is and blah, blah, blah. You ought to be married to her. I don't care how your day is. <laughs> See? That's how she treats me. That's not how I treat you. <laughs> but look, I mean, I'm doing a job. I send you a message and say, hey, this account needs attention. Blah, blah, blah. I don't need to go, hey, Fred, how are you doing today? How's the wife and the kids and blah, 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 blah. So at the same time, we had to record what we did during the day, right? Mm -hmm. So on my time, I would put 30 minutes wasted <laughs> coddling salesmen. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, I would put 15 minutes wasted filling out this stupid sheet. <laughs> it didn't take long and then let me quit coddling the salesman. You need sensitivity training. Look, I'm very sensitive. I am. I just, I'm, I'm short and to the point. Okay. Right, David? I'm, I'm hurting myself right now, biting my tongue. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> if you reach out to me and say, hey, Lori, how are you doing? I'll be like, fine. How are you? I mean, I don't ignore people. Yeah, but we're, that goes down the whole avenue of why ask somebody how they're doing because you know you don't give a crap anyway. That's not true. I won't ask you unless I really care because I'm not fake coddling nobody. <laughs> But most people walk by you and are like, hey, how you doing? Funny part, I love this part. Like when you pass somebody in the store and they don't stop, they just go, hey, how you doing? And they keep going. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, that is so funny to me because they're asking you a question as they don't stop for the answer. <laughs> well, I remember we had a German intern and she said, I need to ask you something. And I said, okay. She said, when people say, how you doing? Do they want an answer or no? I said, no, they don't. Yeah, just say fine. She said, okay, I wondered because they say it as they're running by. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if you say, like, if somebody says, how are you doing? And you go, well, let me tell you, my weekend was pretty bad. I mean, you want to see somebody run? <laughs> it's almost like we ask with the expectations that the response will be good, you. I think it's, it has, at least in the South where we're from, it has become just a salutation. It's just like saying, hi, mm -hmm. hello. How you doing is just saying, hey, there's, there's how no, you doing. There's no expectation <laughs> of a response. In fact, oftentimes there's not even one wanted. Right. It's just that. So I can see how confusing that is. But yeah. Yeah. But if I ask you, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Let me 
properly say that. How are you doing? Then I mean it. Or the more modern version of that. Hey, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody cares what you're up to. <laughs> <laughs> or the more more modern version. Yo. <laughs> That's the, the abbreviated version. <laughs> That's my kid's version. Yo. <laughs> Which is short for, what have you been up to? I haven't seen you in a while. Tell me how you're doing, but I really don't care. Please don't tell me that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so this is kind of a warning to people. If you are thinking about joining the Nacho Kids Academy, I don't coddle. No. We aren't there to make you feel all rosy about things that you're doing that are destructive to your blend. Mm-hmm. Or to yourself. Or to yourself, yes. We are here to help you. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, we're not going to cuss you out and make you feel like scum. Nope. Well, think about it. We're blended family coaches. You take any successful business person, successful athlete, they have coaches. I don't care how good they are. They have coaches that are constantly looking at what they're doing, their performance. They're pushing them. They're holding them accountable. That's how they get good. And think about it. If you've got a fitness coach, they're not going to let you do push-ups the wrong way. No. Just because they might hurt your feelings. Exactly. Be like, oh, I didn't want to hurt her feelings, so I let her pull her back out instead. To me, that's the beauty of having a coach. Is right. because somebody cares enough to make sure you're doing it right, and they don't take your feelings into consideration all the time. And we do care, or we wouldn't do this. Yeah, I mean, it comes from a place of really, really wanting to see you become successful in your blend. Right. I mean— I'm not saying that most coaches out there are like this, but there are some that are not in this for the right reasons. And you can tell quickly who they are. But but I'm telling you, the coaches, not just us, but some of the other coaches that we know that are in this space, they honestly really, really care about people. And they really want to help people to avoid the pitfalls. Yeah, it comes from the heart. It does. I mean, it's one of those things where you know how it feels to struggle like that, you it's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible feeling. And when you have some degree of understanding of, I can help other people avoid that, you feel compelled to really want to keep people from doing it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, I don't know any other way to describe it other than, you know, you, you can see how somebody's in pain and to not reach out and try to help them just seems, seems wrong. Right. So... That's our speech on Lori not being a coddler. (laughs) I bet Joel doesn't coddle. Joel doesn't coddle people Mm -mm. because he tells his kids at school that they're dumb. (laughs) I don't think that's exactly what he said. (laughs) No, I think he does tell them that they're dumb. He's just pushing buttons. Can you imagine a classroom of kids you can push their buttons every day? Oh, my gosh. Wow. I'm kind of envy Joel. Okay. (laughs) I'm going to write the school that Joel teaches at, and I'm going to offer counseling for his kids in his classroom and then for their parents because they're learning how to push buttons and they're practicing at home, I'm sure. Yeah. Look, Joel, you just created a whole new demand for counseling. We should start the Button Pushers Academy. There you go. To teach people how to button push. No. (laughs) (laughs) To teach people how to not be controlled by button pushers. All right, folks, that's our show for today. Yeah, I'm tired now. I can see it in her face. <laughs> Join us next week for another show. Is there another uh, men's thing coming yeah. up? Yeah. All right, join us next week when we have another man for the month of men on the podcast. So remember, for Lori and myself, life is good. When you nacho. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember... Life is good when you nacho.